Greetings and welcome to episode 175 of the Words About Games cast, the weekly video game podcast for Words About Games. I'm your host, Amy Alexander. I'm joined this week by Keith Robinson. YOLO. I brought every convention of podcasting and talking to a camera in that intro. For some reason, I looked everywhere except the camera. <laughs> I was doing that intro, and I don't know why. <laughs> like, All of professionalism, we don't have it. You can even see, you, even halfway through, I was like, no, I need to look at the camera. And then I was like, nope. <laughs> I did for like half a second. I was like, no, now I'm going to look at everything else in the whole world. Keith, how are you? I exist. Okay, that's a fantastic answer. So I was going to do a thing. I was going to talk about Kiz. Gears 5, I finished it last night. The last act. I was going to talk about how amazing the last act of that game is. How, oh, incre- how incredible Laura Bailey's performance was in the game. Um, instead, I feel like I need to wish, issue you a warning, Keith. So here's what went down today. You know not, he knows none of this. So we was, I was talking to Thomas. You, you remember Thomas. He was the guy that loaned me the Wii U that I loaned to Russell. And then I mentioned it on the podcast, and I was like, yeah, it's fine. He's never going to... He never watches the podcast. And that was, like, the one podcast he watched. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. So he watches Friendly Debates. That will become relevant in a moment. We okay. were talking We were talking today while listening to the, the legend... To Taylor Davis, uh, the violinist, doing Legend of oh. Zelda covers. She's got, like, a whole album of them. And we were talking about, like, soundtracks and, and music in video games. Mm-hmm. And how much we both love this Legend of Zelda soundtrack for its uh, iconicness, mm-hmm. and the topic of of uh, an, a video we did a couple of months ago called "Top Ten Video Game Soundtracks" came up. Yeah, um, in which someone sitting in this podcast um, kind of dismissed the Legend of Zelda soundtrack outright. So I don't want to say you're in danger. But I would say you should probably watch your back. <laughs> just a heads. I just thought I better give you a heads up because <laughs> he's probably watched it by now. <laughs> and I don't know if my memory is deceiving me or if it really was as bad as I remember it. But um, yeah, it was like the first thing that got cut, right? <laughs> It's been that long. I can't remember. I do seem to remember us, like me, like suggesting that some of the earlier like um, soundtracks and games can't compare to what we have now, based on the sound, te- like the, the technology we have now to produce sound for a game. Is miles better than it was on you, like the <laughs> SNES? Agree to a point. <laughs> If I, in fact, I remember saying I agree. Well, yes, point. because you start going on about nostalgia and the thirty-six music thing, that, and still cuts out or anyone. Uh, electronic. I'd be, I'd be more worried about you there. Girl. Uh, electronic music, you know, has its flex. Chip tune, as it's called. Yes. As I pointed out to him, because he was like, "You let him cut it," and I was like, "Well, I did," because like from our long list, and as much as I fucking love the Legend of Zelda soundtrack, it would be in my personal top ten. That's how it was in the, in the long list. I. When we do friendly debates videos, there are certain things you just gotta know that you've gotta let go of. <laughs> like to get them to get like other things into the top ten. So I went into that debate and I was like, look, I love Legend of Zelda, but I know it's gonna be one of my sacrificial lambs. What I didn't expect was <laughs> that it was gonna come up first. Because I, I, I put some easy to cut stuff in in my list, like I always do. And then I, I did try to point out that our slogan for friendly debates was don't, don't take the list too seriously because we don't. But I don't know if that sunk in. I think I can hear a sword being dropped. I was going to say, you've got, a lock, you've got locks on your doors, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Just, uh, yeah. I, I think... just need to look for, the, look, look for the person wandering around knocking on doors. <laughs> Are you Keith? <laughs> just the fucking samurai sword are you keith no <laughs> okay. jokes on him there's three of them that live in this street what? Uh-uh. jokes jokes on me he's definitely seeing your face because these are video podcasts 
Did we have up to date video capture? <laughs> like, did I have the new webcam you didn't, when we recorded that one? You didn't have the new like, webcam. You didn't have the new webcam. You might be okay. <laughs> He's just looking for a person that and, looks like a 90s photo. I was going to say, and your Twitter um, photo is quite, is old enough that you still have more, well, you have more hair than you do now. So You might be okay. Like, you might be good. Yeah. And you don't have a beard in your Twitter photo either. Yeah. If You, you can borrow one of my wigs if you need no, to, I like, don't. blend in. I don't. I don't think that's the definition of blending in in any way. But yeah, like you're going for the end of the birdcage. There, it's like <laughs> we need to think this person out or we'll dress them up in drag. I mean, I can do that. I have all of the tools behind Mario and Luigi. Yeah, I, I, I don't doubt it. Um, the feather boa and spot uh, sequin dress included, I'd imagine. Uh, I have one of those things. And I'm not going to tell you which one. For anyone that doesn't know, the Words About Games cast is a weekly podcast where we discuss five stories centered around video games, the games industry, and gaming culture over the past seven days. Before we leave you with a list of what's coming out over the course of the week. This week, we discuss the NPD breakdown for August, the UK Parliamentary Committee recommending loot box regulation, Allegations of unprofessionalism at indie game publisher Callus, the weird Borderlands 3 review situation that developed ahead of last week's launch, and indie game developer Mike Rose's luck in the decline of game sales on Steam. As always, there are timestamps in the description below the, the video on YouTube, so if you want to watch this entire podcast in any order that you feel like, you want to skip parts, or you just want to watch the whole thing backwards, you go right ahead, you do it. You do it. Someone asked me why the, the timestamps start at, like, between 5 to 10 minutes into the video, depending on, like, how much we, we do in the preamble. Yeah. Like, the intro, basically. And I was like, because the previous timestamp would literally be zero zero one. It would be, like, the beginning of the podcast. And I feel like you, yeah. don't, need a, you don't need a link to find that. It, yeah. It's the start of the open... video. Yeah. Go back to the beginning and press play, and you'll find that the 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 fade in, the random discussion about something completely off the wall. Last week's was my ten minute uh, diatribe about astral chain, <laughs> and this week it's me just asking what on earth went on in the game in this that. So there's two news stories that we're not covering in the base thing oh, for this. Okay. Like, we're doing a second. One. One. <laughs> okay. Um, we're doing a second intro, and I might need to put time timestamp for this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The first one is KFC has decided to make a anime dating sim. Hell yeah, they did. Colonel Sanders called Colonel Sanders. I love you, Colonel Sanders. Um, I love you, Colonel Sanders. Yeah. Um. That's insanity in of itself, right? Just go look at this. It looks like a proper anime. And then it's also a dating sim where you're trying to romance the, like, suddenly trim-looking figurehead of this, like, southern <laughs> civil war gentleman. Um, but that's an insanity which happened if you didn't see it on Twitter or just thought it was a mistake. No, it's real. And the second one is... Sid Meier's oh. has entered the Battle Royale game. Civ <laughs> 6, Battle Royale, the Red Death. The Red Death? Everything now has been, has become a Battle Royale. I mean, it's not like it's... Battle Royale. Civ is a Battle Royale. It's not like it's a new game. Like, we're not doing Civ 7. Instead, we're doing Civilization Battle Royale. That's pretty cool. Each phase of the game would like a new era. <laughs> on the Colonel, on the Colonel Sanders thing, I'm not interested until I can romance the chicken. Because let's be fair, like I don't want to romance Colonel Sanders, but I'll romance the hell out of some KFC and chicken. On the Civ, the the, the Civ Six Battle Royale sounds really cool. Like it's just a bit different. I mean, it's not a battle royale in terms of like PUBG, yeah, Fortnite. 
like the the progenitors of the of the formula. Mm-hmm. What is it? It's you've got one unit and you have to like civilian unit and you have to get them to the end of the match. Well, I think it might be two units in the civilian unit and you've got to get them to like a center point. Um, and it's like broken cities and stuff. You, you don't build anything. There's no like actual civilization. You just kind of walk going across an apocalyptic wasteland with like the two units and you've got to get this. <laughs> Sounds interesting. The end. You sound so like they can start life on another planet or something. You sound, yeah, that's just the end of civilization games in general. Yeah. Um, that's where Alpha Centauri came from. That's cool. You sound like me when I was. You sounded like me when when Dawn of War Two came out. Where's my building? You can't build anything in this game. <laughs> because I remember that was my whole deal. I was yeah. I was stupid when I was when I was younger. Dawn of War was still better than Dawn of War 2, though. Should we start? Yeah. I've got to be very careful around this microphone because it's as strong and stable as a Theresa May government. I've got this thread mm-hmm. tape for the for the microphone arm, mm-hmm. but I'm using the regular tape because I haven't had a chance to put the thread tape on yet, and it's it's on, <laughs> as long as I don't hit it. And you know what I like with hitting things? Look out for the timestamp where Amy smacked the microphone off. Oh, that, that'll be... It. That'll be a clip that I'll publish yeah. on Twitter. <laughs> My microphone just going flying. I mean, just being like, number one, NPD August 2019. Uh, you know the drill by now. We do this every yeah. month. These were the top 10 best selling games of August 2019. And number one, Madden NFL 20. And number two, yeah. Minecraft. And number three, Grand Theft Auto 5. Stop. I, I already did. Hang on a minute. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto Five has not only still like set like outselling games like it, it's outselling Fire Emblem and Smash Brothers and, and it's doing this like every single day. I just wanted to point out something I noticed. This game came out in 2013, so it's six years old. On September the 17th, so it's almost at its sixth huh. year birthday. So yeah. it's like um, when we record this, it's two days earlier. When this goes out i believe it will be the birthday of grand theft auto 5 which is still somehow someone sold their soul or there's some massive weird money laundering thing going on because there's something not right with this um, but it's, still, it's, it's still selling really well somehow <laughs> yeah when you think of how long it's been in like the top of the charts every single person on the planet must have a copy of this game. To be fair, though, like someone's making up for me because I've never owned Grand Theft Auto Five on any platform. So someone's making up for us. Yeah. I think we need. I mean, to... next year it'll come out on PlayStation Five and Xbox. Do you have Jason Schreier's email? No. All right, because I feel like we should get Jason Schreier on the case. He's back off his holiday, which you'll be able to figure out pretty quickly as we go through this podcast. Yeah. Um, Why and... after six years? <laughs> we, need, we, need a, we need an investigation in Grand Theft Auto Five, <laughs> Satanic Blood Rituals or something. Anyway, yeah. Number four, Fire Emblem Three Houses. Fucking get in there. And uh, number five, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. Number six, Super Mario Maker Two. Number seven, Mario Kart Eight. Number nine, number eight, <laughs> Mortal Kombat Eleven. Number nine, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. Number ten. Astral Chain. You see what happened there? I skipped yeah. 7 to 9 because the last number in Mario Kart 8 was 8. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I just want to say a shout out to Nintendo for having the middle of the field is literally three of their games. Oh my god. And oh, 4 is like an exclusive on their yeah, console. They've, they've got 5 games in the top 10 bestsellers of last last month, which Even is... Nintendo. Showed love on the shirt. Oh yeah, man. Sorry, the Nintendo's being subsumed <laughs> by my cleavage. But it's there. You can see the kanji. <laughs> um, as a note, two of the new releases in the top 20 was Age of Wonders Planet 4 was at 15th and Man of Medan at 19th. Now you might be thinking, Madden, Minecraft, Grand Theft Auto, all of those games, like, they're not new. They're not, what, 
What does this mean? Well, here's what it means. August 2019 was the worst August in terms of software sales for more than 20 years. Dollar sales of tracked video game software fell 22% versus August last year. That's a lot. And I was trying yeah. to think. What does the NPD when... count digital sales, though? It doesn't, it doesn't. There are certain... There are certain storefronts or publishers or whatever who give them their, their digital sales figures and certain ones they're not. If it was just boxed to retail sales, we wouldn't do the MPD because there'll be mm -hmm. no point. It would be like doing the weekly UK sales chart, which is FIFA. <laughs> it's always FIFA. Um, but no, like some some of them they do, some of them they don't. There's notes because Matt Piscitella, who does the, the breakdown, puts out like a video. Because to get the full MPD, you have to pay for it. You have to actually like buy it. So this is just this is why we just get the summaries. Um, and in the video, it's just like this is then that. I think Nintendo don't give out their digital sales figures to MPD, but then they do because they do it themselves um, off their own backs. I'm gonna hit a pause because there's a game missing from the top twenty that I think we were both hopeful would be well in the top one. Um, didn't actually make an impact, and that game is Control. Yeah. Um. It it it's not in the MPD for for August. I don't like that. No, it's a fantastic um, game. What you just said about not being in the top twenty, I'm quite surprised. Yeah, it didn't make a make an impact. Like Man of Medan was nineteen, but yeah, and Planet Fall was was fifteen. Both of those games. Are lower than sixty dollars. Um, so like, like it's a Resident Evil Two situation where it's like, if this game was sixty dollars, like, or if it was just tracking sales numbers, how much higher would it possibly be? But Control doesn't look great. No, which is bad because it's a really good. Game. I can kind of see why some people might be put off because when it came out, the I've noticed that there's a lot of frame rate issues regarding yeah. the fact that. It's designed for the highest spec platforms. Hundred percent. I mean, I, I ran into them like quite badly. Um, I was on Twitter talking about them, yeah. and some of it was in, made it into my video where I was like, "Look at this! This is the frame rate I was talking about." The thing is, though, not only did I put the time in to play the game to do an impressions video, despite the frame rate issues, but then after I was done with the video making the video, I still went on and finished the game. <laughs> <laughs> because I fucking loved it. Because it's a fucking amazing game. Like, this is easily going to be in my top 10. Like, yeah. at the end of the year. Um, I don't play as many games. I mean, this is currently sitting at my top one game. This is my top game. Yeah, that might get knocked off by a certain game by Respawn, which comes out in or November. Or a certain game by Id. Yeah. November's a big month for you. Yeah. Um, But... Yeah, it's like it's one of my favorite games of the year. Um, like I'm surprised by, like, and I'm a Remedy fan girl. I was surprised by how much I love that game. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've I've gotten like there's there's some Easter eggs, and then there's, there's some flat outs telling you like what's going to happen, and you see like showing the content, like, and then there's the DLC, <laughs> which is like yeah. by the way. <laughs> Alan Wake, and it's like oh shit! Like so, not only will I, not only have I finished Control. Yeah. But I'll be back next year <laughs> to pick yeah. up the content packs because the two content packs are going to be there's one which is spoilery. I won't get into it. We'll yeah. talk about it. I want to do a spoiler because talk about control when you finished it. Mm -hmm. And and the second one is Alan Wake. It's literally the Alan Wake box art, like, and it's just like I mean, yeah, come on. I I'm mean, hoping that still goes forward. I mean, it will. They'll still do the DLC even if they because they can sell it. Yeah at the end of the day like because it's paid content and expansions and i feel like the people who love control love it and will 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 buy the dlc like the attach I mean, rate on that will probably be higher than i would have thought like normal dlc yeah. would be for an, another game it would be wonderful um if like come like not this time not next year, but twenty twenty like one or something. We just get like a, a, a like a game of the year like version of the thing for the new version of the Xbox and PlayStation. Yeah, and then launch. people can like 
yeah, people can play it and go, there's no frame rate issues on this, this isn't me. This is but me. yeah, I've, I've noticed them a couple of times. I've had a couple of bugs, which have just caused me to um, exit the game and restart. But I've never had any, like... I've, I've, it's not as like, you know, I haven't had the frame rate killed me sort of stuff. It's just like, oh, that was annoying. I never had a bug. and I can't think of any bugs that I had. Just, just frame rate issues. Keith, it's at this point that I would move on and talk about the top 10 best-selling games yet a day, but honestly, there's no fucking change <laughs> in the top 10. I think Smash Brothers Ultimate moved up one place. That's it. Grand Theft Auto V is still outselling Red Dead Redemption 2. Days Gone is, is still in the top 10, and Mortal Kombat Grand 11 Mortal 5 is still in the top 10. Mortal Kombat 11 and Kingdom Hearts 3 are still the two top 10 best-selling games of the year. There's a game on here that I want to talk about before we do our speculation game, which is Anthem. It's currently yeah. the fifth best-selling game yet today, right behind Tom Clancy's Division 2. Yeah. Um, little news story dropped this week that I want to just very briefly touch on. Yeah. Because um, I feel like we've, we have the opportunity. These MPD discussions are always quite wide-ranging. We spent 15 minutes once talking about Death Stranding. Um. Anthem went into EA Access yeah. uh, this week. Just gone. That was a surprise. Uh, it came out in February. Uh, that might be the... F that That's faster. Like, it going into EA Access is faster than Mass Effect Andromeda going into EA Access. Um, so now the price for entry to play Anthem is three ninety nine. That's how much a month on EA Access costs. I could download Anthem and play it for all I wanted because I have EA Access because it's just three ninety nine. Um, that's. What do you think of that move? I think it shows that they don't have much faith in that game continuing to be a high earning game. Um, I think EA is basically said, "Yeah, we'll stick it in the EA Access. We might get a few more people playing it." But we're not gonna get. They're not gonna get the like the sixty dollar, yeah, retail on on Anthem. I mean, certain time after launch, like games always drop down price wise. But to go down three ninety nine is very much an indication of yes, we don't have faith in this pro This pro Yeah, like I'm. I mean, Battlefield Five isn't in EA Access, right? And that came yeah. out last. That came out last, not October, November time, and also underperformed based on EA's sales projections yeah there's the there's no more video game sales projections that appear what realistic projections are and then there's what happened with anthem which is there's no oh there's a problem here so there's that, that pretext thing yeah it feels like ea have just yeah have just given up on selling people anthem for like a massive like upfront cost and i'm hoping to just get people to pick it up because they can because yeah. again, the price of entry is three pound ninety nine a month. Like, oh, it's free to play. Well, we know you need the. It's free to play. It's, it's that sort of thing. I mean, if you're in a boat like me, where you just you already have EA access, it is essentially gone free to play. Yeah. Um, like Gears Five. Like I had Game Pass Ultimate, so on 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 the front on the day Gears Five came out, I literally just downloaded it. Like, yeah. It didn't cost me anything yeah. more than it didn't cost me anything more than I was already paying. Yeah. Um, so I just downloaded it and started playing it. But the... Like, yeah, they're just hoping to get people to stick in and then if they can get more people to stick, maybe they can sell some more DLC. Um, if you need to make some first because Cataclysm is, is almost over and there's nothing coming up in the pipeline, which yeah. isn't a great look for a live service game because they're not talking about anything. Yeah. And then just the question of 2019 and probably going into 2020 is, yeah. can it be saved? And I've asked you this question before, and I know there's not really an answer, but it's there, like... There's nothing else to really say about this. They've abandoned their roadmap. The publisher's not got any faith in what's coming out if they're putting it in for three ninety nine. This is something where it's like, there was so much promise for this game, but then when you look behind it, it's like, they were so... It didn't have a chance. Yeah, it flying by their pants, sort of like. Yeah. There's no real content here. There's there's nothing to continue to drive this for. I mean, I don't know much about like the mobas and how they're made and stuff, but World of Warcraft launched with enough content to keep people going through for months. Even though it was a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a month before actually like you know they they'll do the next content thing, like they start doing the new thing, like. 
Yeah. And the moon and the sounds of time and stuff. Well, there's a reason why, even though World of Warcraft Classic has come out, there's yeah. a reason why it's not patch one, it's patch 12. Like, because yeah. that is the, the, the. When people think about Vanilla Wild, that's what they're thinking of. They're not thinking of when it came out, because when it came out, it was a fucking disaster. But it still yeah. kept millions of people playing it, even though it was a disaster. I yeah. should know. I was one of them. <laughs> but uh, like Anthem just dropped off the face of the earth because it was a disaster and there was nothing to really keep people playing. And yet it's still in the top 10 for the year because so many people looked at it and went, I get to be Iron Man in an area. I get to be world. Iron Man. This is a Bioware game. What could possibly go? Yeah. Like, yeah. The power, this is the power of AAA marketing. Like Anthem yeah. is probably still going to be one of the top 10 best-selling games year to date by the end of the year. Can you imagine if Shadow of the to- Tomb Raider, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, or Titanfall 2 had had half of the marketing that Anthem had had? I mean, if Titanfall 2 had had the marketing of Anthem. Yeah. We would be playing Titanfall 3 now, wondering we about would, Titanfall 4. We would respawn would have opened a third studio, right? Yeah. And we would have been playing Apex Legends in February, and we would be playing Star Wars this November, and then next yeah. next March, we would have been playing Titanfall 3. Because they would have had all the money, because Titanfall 2 would have fucking destroyed. Yeah. And, you know, if they'd moved the release date a few weeks as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so we end every MPD discussion with a speculation game. What will be the best, and we, we had to add a caveat, what will be the best new release game of September 2019 and I made a list of the probable contenders well there's only two but I made a list of a few games that are coming out in September or already out uh, Monster Hunter World Iceborne Gears which is sold really well already uh, Gears 5 Borderlands 3 The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening The Surge 2 FIFA 20 and Code Vein there's I, see, I only see two I only see two real contenders and one dark horse in that list. Like, I'm sorry, like, unless, like, the Switch... Because the Switch is blessed right now. So, Link's Awakening might potentially hop to it and and take the number one. It's definitely going to be in the top ten. For me, the dark horse is Gears 5 because it's Gears of War. Purely because it's Gears... Yeah, it's in Game Pass, but we have this weird phenomenon where if a game is good and it's in Game Pass, that somehow makes its sales even better. Like we've we've seen this with like Forza Horizon Four, like it sold was the best selling Forza game of the entire franchise, despite the fact that it was available in Game Pass and people could pick it up for like seven ninety nine. Mm-hmm. Um, the two that it's Borderlands Three or FIFA Twenty, I would have thought. FIFA Twenty is where I'm putting my money. I'll be contrarian then. I'll, I'll put my money on Borderlands 3. Because nice. there's a lot of marketing and a lot of hype behind that game. Yeah. Despite some issues, which we'll get into later on in the podcast. Shall we move on? Yeah. Not next, though. That would have been a perfect segue if I'd have thought about it. But instead, number two. UK Parliamentary Inquiry recommends regulating loot boxes. This is from Jody McGregor over at PC Gamer. who writes... A nine-month parliamentary inquiry by the UK's Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport resulted in an 84-page report based on evidence taken from game developers, trade bodies and academics, though it claimed there was a lack of honesty and transparency among game company representatives. Shocker. The committee MP, the committee chair MP Damien Collins took issue with the position of the UK Gambling Commission, which has repeatedly stated that loot boxes aren't gambling saying that gaming companies need to be more responsible, and if the government wants to maintain their current stance, that loot boxes should be exempt from the Gambling Act, they need to publish a paper explaining why. The committee also recommended to gam- the committee also recommended the gambling content warning label be applied to games with a corresponding age limit. The inquiry wasn't just investigating the connection between loot boxes and gambling, however. It also called for the games industry to support research into the long-term effects of gaming and criticise the implementation of age verification systems more generally. So there's a lot to unpack. It's a short story, but there's a lot of to, like, you could unpack mm. in that story. So this is, we talked about this once on the podcast before. 
uh, yeah. not that long ago. This is the surprise. This is where the surprise mechanics quote came from. The comp. This was the parliamentary right. committee. This is this is the same thing. This is this is the end report result of yeah. um of that particular. Th- I don't even know what to call that quote. Yeah, where do you want to start? <laughs> um, I mean. It came with a lack of honesty and transparency amongst game company representatives. I wonder if that is a direct thing at the whole. Oh, they're just uh, changing the thing, the surprise mechanics, and then public the, like they're representing the Britain going, Oh, they're just surprise mechanics. We don't think them as loot boxes. And then one of their representatives starts. Was it the shareholders thing where they're going on about loot box mechanics? Um, it had been the person had said that from who worked at EA and it had been like three weeks since they had they put out that tweet it was like less yeah. than a month I'm sure since they put out the tweet yeah. about Star Wars where I was like no loot boxes don't you mean no yeah. surprise mechanics <laughs> like, um, so that was the thing like they didn't though like we read the we read a lot of the transcripts and we read a lot of them on the podcast and it was like yeah you didn't really they didn't really cover themselves in glory I mean neither did the MPs I'm remembering that long exchange about about text chat in in Fortnite. You know, the thing that doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> and the massive back and forth about it. Um, but I mean, this is what happens, right? Like governments get involved. They don't really understand how anything works, but they know that it could be a problem, and they can do the think of the children thing. So that's what they do. <laughs> it's all unfolding. As I prophesied. <laughs> and I don't want it to. Like I don't want I don't want this to be an Amy was right moment, but the games industry's not cleaning its shit up. So what are governments gonna do? <laughs> Other than the same thing that they always do. Uh, what do you think about loot boxes like just in general? Like They've made a recommendation to the government, which more or less isn't a thing at the moment. It's a whole yes, thing we, we won't get have into. A government at the moment, so we'll have to wait. Yeah, we don't quite have a we'll government wait. right now, but we're working on it. Um, but like, let's say the government, whichever government comes back into office, um, like takes on the recommendation, does all the stuff that the committee says. So let's play a thought exercise. So they say that the loot boxes are gambling. They age, age gate all the games that have loot boxes in them. All the prize yeah. mechanics. Uh, um, they're not exempt from the gambling act. They need licenses. They need content warning labels. Like, because we're the sixth biggest. Like, this isn't a Belgium or Netherlands situation. The United Kingdom is the sixth biggest. Add in six. To the years on there about how who can play it, yeah, and having that little violence tag on the back have another thing underneath it saying gambling. gambling. I mean, part of me thinks that yeah, that could really affect them, and another part of me is going, is it going to be really that big of an impact to them if it says eighteen on here instead of sixteen and instead of twelve? Because although yes, um. Blizzard wants to be a family-friendly company and everything. Activision Blizzard does make a lot of money out of loot boxes, surprise mechanics in various ways, and so many people just don't pay attention, like, when buying a game. As far as they pay attention is, oh, can't you go get it from the shops? Like, well, no, because it's an age-restricted game. It's like, okay, then I'll go get it for you. That is the attitude of a lot of people in this. They don't right. pay attention to the ratings. That's why... I- the violence thing never really took hold. And in this country, like, I'd, I'm not a legal expert, but, mm-hmm. like, from everything we've talked about on this podcast for the last yeah. two years, wow, since uh, Shadow of Mordor, yeah. Shadow of War, like, kicked this whole thing off, mm-hmm. um, I've learned a lot, and I don't think our anti-gambling laws are quite as strict as America's anti-gambling laws. No. Um... Age, the age restriction on FIFA. Yeah. Like, because the thing is, right? As much as, yeah, cool, like, there's an age restriction on the box and whatnot. 
like more parents are having to become more mindful about how they set their consoles up in terms of yes. age restrictions and parental controls. And we're buying more games digitally than we are in boxes. Kids aren't going to be able to buy FIFA, potentially. Like, there's going to be that extra step of, you know, mm -hmm. like, this is an age-restricting game, like, on their digital storefront. It's That's probably the, the biggest sort of influence that yeah. that potential scenario would have, I think. And it might make some parents stop and lock and go, hold on a minute. <laughs> and I mean, it wouldn't just be FIFA. Like, think about all the games that would end up behind a, an, an age right, age gate like that. Mm. You're out of focus, by the way. You know. Um, I don't know how to fix it. That's just... <laughs> Overwatch put you out of focus. Activision Blizzard was doing its thing. Um... I like the fact that they criticized the um, implementation of age verification systems in games because, yeah, I mean, that's horrible. <laughs> like, I circumvent the age of it. Like, I'm th over 30 years old, yeah. and I, circ I circumvent the age restriction system on Steam whenever I'm going onto Steam on my phone on the web browser and I'm like, I'm looking up a game and it's age restricted and it gives me the drop down menu. And all I do is I just click the. <laughs> click yeah. the, the yeah and i just scroll and then i just hit the first thing that comes up but i'm pretty sure at one point i said i was 100 years old <laughs> yeah um the, the, the uk government did come up with a, a version of a getting round which we were going to instigate on uh for adult material online a uh, poll which was that before you could access that material the owner of the website would have to message her royal majesty's revenue and customs <laughs> Um, with the data you provided, which would be your name, date of birth, and where you lived, and then they would confirm it. Yeah. That from the census rules that someone that age lived there. Just to watch porn. Now, here's the problem with that. Here we go. I'm going to sit back. Any kid can circumvent that by just inputting their, their, their parents' name and date of birth and their postcode. In... Indeed. <laughs> it's no better. It's just all they're doing is they're taking this thing and they're giving it like it's the exact same workaround. You're just using snail mail <laughs> instead of a website. Like, come on, guys. This is we paid you millions of pounds and this is the best you could come up with. <laughs> Fuck. I'd be livid. Um But yeah, no, it's interesting. We'll see what happens. Like it's the Nothing's going to get implemented anytime soon because we don't have a government in the United Kingdom right now. Yeah. Um, five weeks, no, and, four more weeks. We and, get it back. And yeah, four more weeks till we get the government back. That's if we don't have a general. It's a whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's move on before we discuss yeah. the intricacies of batshit yeah. insanity that is the United Kingdom's political structure. Number three. Dicalis president accused of unprofessional conduct. This is this story that I'm going to read is from Brendan Sinclair over at GamesIndustry.biz. However, it's a summarized version of a full investigation by Jason Schreier, who's back off his holiday, um, and has written a massive long piece. And you know what? I just couldn't. I read the piece, the whole piece, and nothing but the piece. But like, I couldn't do the thing I normally do where I was picking bits and pieces out of it and to create a thing. So I just found someone who wrote a good, good summary. So go and read Jason's film thing. But here it is. Former employees and partners of Binding of Isaac Rebirth and Cave Story publisher Nykalis have gone public with grievances about the company and its president, Tyrone Rodriguez. A Kotaku report based on conversations with seven former employees and four developers describes a number of questionable behaviours. For those who worked for Nykalis, Rodriguez was controlling, exploitative, and often used inappropriate language in work settings. Chat logs provided to Kotaku by its sources show Rodriguez using racist, anti-Semitic, and ableist remarks when discussing businesses. One former employee said the company had no HR apparatus, so any complaints about Rodriguez's behaviour would have to be made to Rodriguez himself. Can we just pause that and consider that in, like, 20, like 21st century, you don't have a HR department in, like, in a large company. Yeah, um, this isn't an indie startup. This is a yeah. 
big, fairly big publishing company. Like, sorry, I just want to lampshade that. <laughs> I mean, I did just do the living up. embodiment of the Drew Scanlon gif. Just <laughs> what the fuck? Like, my god, yeah. You don't have an HR department. So I'm going to complain about the boss. Okay, then you just sit in a meeting and, and the boss is there and you're just like, that. this is... I mean, I remember when Jeremy Hawkins made this joke in the D&D live stream. It's like, you're going you're to have to speak to uh, HR. I'm also HR. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my fucking word. Anyway. Uh, other former employees said the executive pressured them to drink excessively and go on outings with them. One said he refused to comply once while on a trip to Japan, and Rodriguez responded by berating him and saying things like, Why do you think. Who do you think paid for your trip? That employee was fired shortly after. Others told Kotaku Naikalis had removed people's names from the credits of projects they worked on after they left the company. On the developer side, reported issues with Naikalis mostly centered around the publisher suddenly halting communications or cutting ties with partners. Dodge Roll Games designer Dave Crook said his studio and publisher Devolver had worked out a deal with Nykalis to port Enter the Gungeon to the PlayStation 4 in 2016. Dodge Roll went so far as to sign an NDA and provide Nykalis with source code for the game, but Rodriguez soon stopped answering emails. Quote, Due to the lack of communication, we were forced to move on and found another partner to help us with the port, Crooks told the site. Another developer, whose game was eventually released by Nikalis, said the company went months without responding to them on multiple occasions. The Game Baker's co-founder, Audrey LaPrince, told Kotaku that Nikalis had strung it along for months with spotty communication about a potential publishing deal for Fury before the developer got fed up and walked away. Kotaku also noted a pair of developers with Nikalis published games, Wonderboy the Dragon's Trap developer Lizard Cube and Save Me Mr. Taco creator Chris... Denius. No, I, 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 I hadn't I blanked on that name. You said it, and that sounds wonderful. It's one of those things where you, when you say it out loud, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's Mister Taco T A K O. But once you say it out loud, it's like ah, uh, ah. Uh, uh, Chris Denius told fans on Twitter that they had submitted patches for their games to Nikalis, but the publisher hadn't bothered to release them. Nikalis responded to Kotaku by saying it works hard to create an environment where we treat our team members with respect. That's a quote, and so is this. We do not condone, abu condone abusive workplace environments or discrimination and have people from all walks of life. <laughs> they really went with that. Okay. We hope for the continued success of our internal team and our external developers. Regarding the companies under mutual NDA with Nikalis, Devolver, publisher of Enter the Gungeon, and the Game Bakers, developers of, of Fury, we can only comment that we do not have any signed publishing agreements with them, and never have, end quote. Kotaku also spoke with Edmund McMillan, one of the original developers behind a handful of Nikalis's better-known titles like The Binding of Isaac, Rebirth, and The End is Nigh. Macmillan said that he would go ahead with the planned release of the next Binding of Isaac DLC, but he was cancelling plans to work with the publisher on parts of two upcoming games. Tumbleweed. Thoughts? Yeah. I mean, there's a one-on-one on how to run your business. Um, and there's, there's stuff like, like it's like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll do this for you. We'll, 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 we've got some stuff. So that, yeah, like, tumbleweed, tumbleweed goes past. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we don't know what was going on at the at the time. but Yeah, we can, like, react to the the specifics that are over on the Kotaku article, like the chat logs where they've got the screenshots and, and whatnot. Like, the the this summary is very general whereas like you could really like we could go to the Kotaku article and we could get really in depth about the things that Tyron Rodriguez said um, yeah. I don't think we need to like I think we've heard this before like that's my overriding thing of like we've heard most of these things before from different I mean, not having a HR department that's a new, new one on me <laughs> that yeah. is a new one I wonder if, also, if they have a PR department if they don't have a HR department <laughs> I mean like Callis isn't small like the, I mean, like Binding of Isaac Rebirth, Cave yeah. Story. Like Cave Story was like the first big indie game. Essentially, it was like the first one that was like, ah, this is something everybody plays. Um, but they don't have an answer. The, the, I like the I like the deployed use of uh, we we can't be racist. My I, my best friend's black. Defense, like. <laughs> 
We, we do not condone abusive workplace environments or discrimination and have people from all walks of life. We can't be ableist. One of our, one of our employees is disabled. Like, that kind of crap just... Yeah. It's so fucking obvious. Like, just... Right the way from, like, when David Cage did it with Quantum Dream. It's like, just... Just don't say it. Just, just don't say it. It's another one of those... A PR person could have really helped you with this statement. Um... I don't really want to let stuff like this go, though, because it's like, yeah. there's nothing particularly new apart from the fact that this is Nykalis we're talking about and not mm -hmm. Epic, Rockstar, Netherrealm, any of the fucking dozen or so game developers and publishers that have come up like we've talked about in the past year. Um, but it's like, you don't want to get desensitized to it. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. and, and just like, go, you know, this isn't cool. Because for all we were talking about when we were talking about the, the thing a couple of weeks ago, um, with all of the, the sexual abuse stories, it's just like talking about stuff helps because it makes sure that in the future, like, these things will hopefully be less prevalent. Like, not if Nykalis is a terrible developer, a ter terrible publisher to work for, less people will go to them to publish their game, which is a good thing. Or Nykalis will clean up its act, which is also a good thing. The The thing I want to mention as well, there was the thing here. The two, the publishers Wonderboy and Save Me Mr. Taco, where they, they, told people, they told fans on Twitter that they'd submit patches for games to Nykalis, but the publisher had bothered to release them. I remember that section from the original story over on Kotaku, and, which goes into a little bit more detail, where Nike Ellis allegedly just told the, at least one of the developers that they weren't going to release the patch because the game didn't sell very well, so it wasn't worth it for them. And that's fucking shocking. Like, for the people who did actually buy the game, mm -hmm. like, on Switch, or, like, you know what I'm saying, for example, and, like, they're getting a worse experience because... The, the publisher isn't pushing the patch out to them. Like, here's mm -hmm. a, here's, a, here's a thought, dinguses. If you actually push the patch, which will fix a bunch of issues, maybe more people will buy the game. <laughs> that's one-on-one, -on -one, like you were just saying. That's one-on-one, -on -one, like a game thing one-on-one, -on -one, right? If they can turn around and be like, well, we fixed a bunch of issues. Cool. And then people might say, hey, they fixed a bunch of issues. Like, control. We, I was just reading... Um, Digital Foundry were talking about it. Like, there's a new patch come out on PS4 for Control, which is like it's fixed a lot of the frame rate issues. Great. That might that might not convince people who are on the on the fence because of the the frame rate issues. Because they only have a base model PS4, then go well. Now I really want to play this game because the people who are playing it are talking really positively about it. Now I'll pick it up. And it's the same thing here on a smaller scale. Also, Tyrone Rodriguez just sounds like a bit of a dick. But that's just me. That's just that. I mean, we're not that far removed from the last time we were talking about stuff like this. So the 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 uh, the lack of HR is a new one, though. Yeah. Should we move on? Mm -hmm. I just realized what's next. Number four, Borderlands Three review situation sure is strange, and this is from Jason Schreier over at Kotaku. He writes, and this is bizarre, this is bizarre, Borderlands 3 reviews hit the internet last week, but only at a select few websites, thanks to a bizarre scenario that Publisher 2K says is in place because of security concerns. Typically, video game reviewers work off early retail copies of games provided by publishers. They could be either digital or physical, and they function like any other game you'd buy in a store. Excuse me. Our forthcoming review of Le of Zelda Lake's Awakening, for example, will be based on an early retail code provided by Nintendo that functions just like the proper game will when it comes out on the eShop. Occasionally, game publishers will send out very early game builds on debug consoles that work a little differently, but these days that's rare. Usually reviewers are playing the same game that everyone else will, just a week or two earlier. In the case of Borderlands 3, which came out on Friday for PC and consoles, things are unusual. Rather than sending out codes for the game, 2K game reviewers... 
2K Gave reviewers, special Epic Game Store accounts loaded up with early, work-in-progress builds for Borderlands 3. A bizarre scenario that we've never seen before, as Polygon explained in their review. Quote, 2K Games and Gearbox didn't send out review codes for Borderlands 3, instead they set reviewers up with new Epic Game Store accounts with the game unlocked and gave us a few warnings about the game being a work in progress. They asked us to stay away from the DirectX 12 implementation, for example, and told us that our progress in these builds may or may not carry over to the final game." End quote. As a result, Polygon reviewer Ben Kuchera wrote, he and some of his colleagues ran into some severe technical issues, including random crashes and in one case, someone losing 6 hours of progress and having to start from scratch. Some other reviewers complained of technical problems, others did not. Kotaku requested access to Borderlands 3 for a review but didn't get access. A representative for 2K cited security concerns and told us we'd get code for the much-anticipated loot shooter on Thursday, September 12th, the day before it launches. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, the website VG247 reports that they and their fellow European video game outlets haven't gotten codes, haven't gotten codes for security reasons. This all comes a month after, take, after 2K and its parent company Take 2 went after a YouTuber who was posting leaked information about the game. Let's pause. Let's hit the pause button there. We're going to avoid the bug thing. <laughs> because we're going to talk about that specifically in a moment. But is there anything you want to talk about from this specific situation other than how fucking bizarre it is? Um, basically... <laughs> but they've turned around and said is we don't these specific websites is what they've said. Sarah, when, when I read this, obviously it was after the reviews had dropped. Sorry, I cracked my knuckles right in front of the camera. I don't know why. When it was after the reviews had dropped, the B Borderlands 3 had a Metacritic score of like 80 plus. Um, and there was a, but there was a couple of reviews I'd seen. Because I'm not planning, like, I don't read reviews normally, but I'm not planning on playing Borderlands 3, so I was curious. I just thought I'd have a look. Um, and a couple of them were talking about, like, really severe technical issues, and then a lot of the other reviews weren't. And I thought, that's a bit weird. Because normally, like, if there's technical issues, like, everyone will touch on them, unless they're, like, Anthem, in which case that's what most of the reviews will be about. Um... But, like, it was varying wildly between people not talking about them at all, and some people were like, Polygon's thing was just like, the game's fucked. <laughs> and here's why it's because we've been given a work in progress build. So, here's my first question What's the point in reviewing a work in progress build of a game? Is that not like me reviewing PUBG when it first came out in early access? Which I didn't do because there's no point because it's not going to be the same game when it launches. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like they're working down to the uh, wire. If they were given the. I they well yeah except they like like that's the assumption I would make right like yeah. okay so they give it like so I've had review copies before of games and sometimes um, I got a review copy of Mass Effect and Trumpeter of all games. Um, and you get, like, with the bigger AAA games, you generally get review guides. Um, and you, these are usually, like, everything you need to know about the game. So you can, like, go into it with, like, the full context of what the game is and stuff like that. There's, like, they'll be like, these quests are important. Or these, like, this is cool content we want you to, like, we'd, we'd like you to see. You know? Like, this is the cool stuff that's in the game. And... <laughs> I don't know how much of this I'm supposed to say. I might never get a review copy off anyone ever again for going into this. But sometimes, in the case with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which I got a copy of, Far Cry New Dawn, which I got a copy of, and Mass Effect Andromeda, there was like known bugs and issues that were going to be fixed in a day one patch. But because I was playing the game early, I didn't have the day one patch. So you tend to like play around those in that I give Ubisoft when they gave me odyssey the benefit of the doubt because they know it's an issue they fixed it if i run into it i'm generally not going to mention it in my right above the game mm -hmm. and that's where i wonder if i wonder if like the, the sites and outlets and whatever that did get access to borderlands 3 a work of progress build and there was lots of bugs like had that same list and then didn't talk about the issues in the game the only difference is what I was playing of Assassin's Creed Odyssey, for example, was more or less the finished game. 
mm-hmm. then it was just telling me what was in the day one patch. Whereas this was a work in progress of the game. Like they couldn't even tell the reviewers whether the game would carry their progress over and into the full game when it was released, which which means that the game that they were playing was potentially not even going to be the same version of the game that <laughs> that launched on Epic Game Store. Um which is telling. And then I guess it's just it's pointless to review that. What's the point? Because it might not even necessarily be the same game. Yeah. But if you talk around the bugs and the issues, you're potentially getting caught out because the bugs and the issues could still be there. <laughs> because you yeah. don't know what's going to be in the day one patch. And as it turns out, a lot of bugs and issues that places like Polygon were talking about were still in the final game. I made a list. Thanks to Reddit, Kotaku, and Polygon, um, I put together a a list of bugs. Some of them are pretty funny. (laughs) This one is my favorite. The first one... The first one is my favorite. <laughs> so here's a list of bugs. Players are reporting that upon joining another player's game, he was further than they are. All quests up until that point will complete, and all the audio will play at once. <laughs> that sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but really funny at the same time. Like, could you imagine streaming the game? <laughs> yeah. When you join someone. Like, if I was streaming the game and I joined Fixer, he was like massively yeah. far ahead of me, and all of a sudden, like the audio from hell just started playing because like twenty quests just automatically completed all at once. Yeah. Uh, it just sounds like that like bit in the Event Horizon where you <laughs> play the video or where the video plays about what happened when they disappeared. It's like oh oh god yeah like. Uh, there's frame drops reported across consoles and PC at various locations, especially when aiming down the sights. Uh, those using ultra wide monitors may notice parts of the screen cut off during cutscenes. So the cutscenes obviously weren't rendered with all ultra wide resolutions in mind. Mm-hmm. Audio can cut out at times. The day is gone bug, <laughs> as I like to call it. Uh, if DirectX 12 is enabled on PC, you may not be able to get past the claptrap loading screen before the game begins. Uh, players may need to double click on items in menus for it to register. Menus frequently lag and stutter. Mission objective markers disappear, NPCs disappear, and then you just can't complete quests, uh, and the game crashes. So the one I wanted... There's a lot of bad bugs in there, right? The one I wanted to bring focus on, to go back to what I was just talking about, is the DirectX 12 bug. Because it sounds like you load the game in, and there's a loading screen, and then it crashes if you're using DirectX 12. Don't use DirectX 12. That's what they told Polygon not to do in in the work in progress version of the game. Yeah. So... The game is fucked, but they somehow like I can't. Get, I don't want to give Two K Games the benefit of the doubt because of everything that's gone on in the past six months with Borderlands Three. Because I want to believe them when they say security issues, but I feel like all they've done is they've set up a situation where a bunch of outlets are going to write around the bugs, assuming that they're going to be fixed, like I would have done. Two K Games makes the Civ games, doesn't it? Uh, they publish the save games. Fraxis makes them two game publishers. Yeah, uh, it's just that the the, the Direct Twelve thing reminds me they have they, they've had problems with um, launching on Direct Twelve before at launch. I, th- I think it was Civ Five, but the Civ Six had to both um, Direct Twelve. Yeah, they do, don't they? I remember yeah. that Civ Five did because I remember because I had Civ Five at launch and I was trying yeah. to play it and it kept crashing. I, I, all, all I remember is like because the the thing would come up when I loaded it up on Steam, and it was those d- direct te- like ten, and then the new one, and I knew. I, yes, I knew X-Con it was the one because they had issues with the, like. Because I had, issues. you remember, I had significant problems with XCOM too. Yeah, because I remember I was showing you screenshots of like just everything was pink, like yeah. stuff like that. It was like I was having really bad issues with XCOM XCOM too. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no, I never no. had as many, but that might be because I I just always hit the low one. Yeah, I was just trying to play it on DirectX 12 because I built this massive PC. Like, would I want to play it the best? Like, no one told me not to. So, yeah, um, yeah, like I want to give them the benefit of the doubt and say the security issues, and we'll get to that in a second because I want to unpack that. But like, I can't see past this situation of like. Because I've been on the other side of the looking glass. Like, if if they gave me an early copy of the game and said, these are non-bugs, we're going to fix them, I would have gone, cool. Well, I won't talk about them in my review 
impressions video, whatever. And then that boosts the the positive reception of the game coming out before the game's launched. More people pre-order, more people buy it. Mm-hmm. And I know I've got my tinfoil hat on right now, but at the same time, it's like that makes perfect sense <laughs> to me. Like, just, am I just crazy? I mean, we know that they've had security concerns with uh, Borderline Three, but why they said to like quite a few different um, well-known websites. Hey, we're not giving you like an advanced version for security yeah. reasons, and then giving it the other ones. It's like you're obviously saying that you you're trusting this individual more than you're trusting those individuals, but we don't know the reasons why. Yeah, like I don't know what their list was. Yeah, I can speculate. Like no one in Europe, as far as I was aware, got a code or like got a, an account with a game on it, and that's probably because the accounts that they had with the unlocked versions of the game were all American. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense to me. It doesn't, but it does. Like, that specific thing makes sense, that they probably didn't have any European accounts for the game. But what security concerns? (laughs) Because what I was thinking was, oh, it's piracy, right? They just don't want the game to leak onto on a pirate, like torrents and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But even if you give someone an account with with Borderlands 3 unlocked on the account, it's not xCloud, it's not Stadia, they're still going to be downloading the entire game onto their hard drive. Yeah. So, like... And, like, you're going to accuse Kotaku, Kotaku, (laughs) or Eurogamer, of, like, leaking a game. (laughs) I mean, they'll leak the existence of a game, but they're not going to upload the fucking thing onto a torrent site. Yeah. They're not going to sell the keys off. (laughs) Yeah. Like... So, like, I don't, like, I can't wrap my head around what possible security concerns they could have. Bearing in mind, like, the security concerns that they had with Submato, which was mentioned in this thing, which is, like, where they sent the private investigators to his house, was all about information about the game getting out. Guess what? It's a fucking review. (laughs) That's the point. (laughs) You're supposed to be getting information out about the game. Yeah. I'm so confused. Like... I've gone down a rabbit hole trying to sort of suss this out in my head as like what they were thinking. And the only explanation I've got is the tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. They thought they would be too honest. <laughs> yeah. Polygon was. <laughs> but Polygon doesn't necessarily matter because they don't give out scored reviews. Yeah. <laughs> the Metacritic average of Borderlands 3 was quite high. And I'm not having a go at the outlets who wrote the reviews, because like I said, I've done the same thing where I've run into a couple of bugs in Assassin's Creed Odyssey that I haven't talked about because they were going to get fixed in the day one patch. I give Ubisoft the benefit of the doubt, despite the fact that Unity exists. That probably wasn't a good idea, but they had fixed them by the time the patch came out. So, you know, it was all good. It's a line you've got to... you got to walk sometimes, but... The weirdness of that entire situation was did like would have given me a lot of pause if if they'd been like here's an account with the game. Thanks, I guess it's work in progress. Don't use DirectX 12. <laughs> here's a massive list of bugs. Sometimes your audio might cut out. Still the most like that's. Still, my overriding memory of Days Gone, like months out in advance, is that moment where all the sound of my bike just cut out and was just gliding along <laughs> the roads. It made the game a lot creepier. <laughs> <coughs> oh man, uh, should we move on? Yes. I can see your pink anonymous chinchilla thing moving down the the Google Doc. <laughs> For anyone who has watched, I just watched this thing. It's moving all over the place. <laughs> Dick. Number five. Mike Rose. Indie developers are pricing their Steam games too low. This comes from Rebecca Valentine over at Games Industry. Dot Biz Who writes... An increase in free-to-play games, increasing numbers of game releases, subscription services, and lower game prices are all contributing to a year-over-year decline in game sales on Steam, says No More Robots founder Mike Rose. If his name sounds familiar, that's the guy who got into it with G2A that we talked about a couple of months ago. Yeah. 
Rose has published a report entitled How Well Are PC Games Selling in 2019? that focuses on one month, July, of game sales on Steam within specific parameters, in which he determines that average game sales on the platform by unit have dropped 70% year over year, with average revenue declining 47% year over year. In the report, Rose examined Steam games released between July 5th and August 6th that met certain parameters. They had to have at least 10 user reviews. Around 78% of the initial pool of 900 games was removed here. AAA titles were removed, and then the top and bottom 5% were removed to reduce noise from outliers. This left around 170 games total, which is still a mental amount of games, for which Rose used publicly available data such as Steam group numbers, store page review numbers, prices and algorithms for calculating first year revenue from first month revenue. Within these parameters, Rose found that the average game on Steam sells 1500 copies and makes $16,000 in revenue in its first year. This is compared to the same data from last year, where the average game sold 5,000 copies and made $30,000 in revenue. Another notable point of comparison between the two data sets is that the average game sold in 2018 cost $12 at full price, while the average 2019 game cost $10. Rose suggests this indicates that developers are pricing their games too low, and offered another set of data that demonstrated that games priced at $10 or less, selling a medium a median of 10,000 copies and making $6,000 in revenue, with unit sales and revenue steadily increasing as price increased. Games priced over $20 on average sold 5,000 copies and made $200,000 in revenue. Ross concludes by suggesting that appropriately pricing a game as opposed to lowering the price in hopes of making a game more enticing, having a marketing plan and building communities around a game can be effective ways to increase sales and move into the top 1% of games on Steam. It's a it's a Steam story, but it's not like the usual Steam stories we talk about. <laughs> you have any thoughts? It makes my eyes gloss like my, my eyes gloss over <laughs> and my head begins to roll back. <laughs> like, like indie uh, indie developers charge more for your games. Okay, here's the math. <laughs> I mean, that's a very rudimentary breakdown of the numbers as well. <laughs> Get to the chopper. Different movie. There is something to be said about games and perceived value, though. You're gone. Okay. Where it's like, there was a conversation about this where, in funnily enough, in July, what, how... <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> You didn't know about the stats. No, I didn't. I didn't know you had a trap. No. Come back. Um, there was a thing about this about Wolfenstein, uh, Youngblood, when it came out in July, because it was a, th I want to say a $40 game. Mm -hmm. I rented it. I don't, I didn't buy it. It was cheaper. But then there was that perception of what's wrong with it. Like, because they were trying so hard to be like, it's the full game. It's a full Wolfenstein experience. It's just cheaper. And it's like, if it had been $60, do you, they wouldn't have had to go in so hard on the whole thing of like, it's a full game. Like, uh, And I found it interesting that Mike Rose has numbers to back it up where it's like, if you charge more for your game, you'll make more money. Like, and not just in the, because like, you'll have the same amount of sales and you'll make like X amount extra. It's like, you will actually sell more, more copies of your game if you price it more because there's a perceived value thing that tricks off in people's heads where it's like this indie game is twenty four ninety nine, therefore I know it is of quality. This indie game is nine ninety nine. Which means it's probably a two hour experience that you you know what I mean? Yeah. Why I found that bit, bit particularly fascinating. I mean the fact that game sales on Steam are slowing down is interesting. Like once you remove like I mean I it is quite funny that like, uh, the first parameter of, like, okay, so the game has to have at least 10 user reviews, and that eliminated 78% of the games from the pool straight away. Like, there's a lot of games on Steam, yo. Yeah. Like, there were almost 900 games released between July 5th and August 6th. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. How is anyone supposed to sell anything on this hell, hell all of a platform? Take the floor, Keith. How is anyone supposed to sell anything when there's 900 games coming out in the dry um, spell? <laughs> it, 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 
basically pot luck to see if yours gets picked, really. Uh, people will go on the storefront with money and click on something that they like the look of. Yeah, but like, you never judge your game by its cover, for starters. Um, like, how do you like start? Uh... <laughs> okay, sometimes you can judge a game by its cover. Like, how do you stand out? Have a marketing plan and build a community around a game. Well, building a community around a game is tough, right? Like, yeah. you're not going to be Untitled Goose Game, which has got a cult following and has for years. Mm-hmm. Boyfriend Dungeon. Like, you have to have a... Like, I'm thinking, I'm sudden thinking, like, the games that have already built communities around themselves are generally, like, a specific type of game. Yeah. And I don't have a word for it. <laughs> Because meme game isn't correct. Because there are meme games and they're horrible. Um, like there are certain developers who build communities around themselves, like Devolver Digital. Devolver Digital will have no problem ever getting noticed because yeah. they're Devolver fucking digital. But we're gonna pirate our own games. <laughs> we can do that. We're gonna bootleg our own games. Wait, we can do that. Two <laughs> <laughs> D D mix of like every oh. I best surprise of A3 that that was actually a thing. It was real. They released it. <laughs> Go on the Steam. It will send you straight to a launcher. That was amazing. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I didn't think it was going to be much of a discussion. I just thought that was interesting, especially yeah. with you um, having a prediction for like Steam is going to double down on being an open platform. And I've spent the last nine months in agony trying to figure out how I could possibly judge that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, they have basically done nothing. Yeah. Apart from kind of, like, accidentally egg on some, like, hate on... I was going to say, like... a apart, open platform. Apart from taking your petrol bomb and throwing it into the, into the, the, the petrol station, <laughs> that was the epic game star situation. Like... They haven't really done anything. They've they've changed their algorithm again, which is fucked. The which seems to have fucked a bunch of indie developers over because now it's just recommending a bunch of AAA games to people. Yeah, um, changing their algorithm and fucking over a load of indie developers is it must be Tuesday. Like <laughs> Steam is. There must be an R in the month as well. <laughs> <laughs> like it must be Monday because the podcast is coming out, so we have to talk about our Steam's fucked in the developers again. <laughs> like algorithms, right? As somebody who is exists on YouTube, and as somebody who uses or used to use Steam as a, as a storefront and now just uses it as a launcher, um, algorithms are not the future. Algorithms don't work. <laughs> I will always go back to last year when I watched the Battlefield 5 reveal trailer because I was interested in seeing the Battlefield 5 reveal reveal trailer from E3 and then I was inundated with recommendations for how SJWs were ruining Battlefield because there was a woman in the game. Do you want to watch those? No, I don't want to watch those. (laughs) What in my long viewing history on YouTube suggests that that's the content you should be pushing on me right now? But that's what the algorithm dictated, because those were the most, not necessarily popular, but the most interacted, interacted with. with videos about Battlefield Five on YouTube. And it's the same thing with this new algorithm, where it's like you like first, you you like the look of this first person shooter. Here's Call of Duty, because that's the most interacted with first person shooter on Steam, right? Not oh, maybe this game that like. Who needs Call of Duty recommended to them? (laughs) Everybody knows what that game is. (laughs) But if you recommended me something like, I don't know. um, Shit. The name of the game just escapes from like Void Bastards. Like, cool, I might not have heard of that. (laughs) I mean, I have because, you know, I'm a game person and I know everything. Except the one game every games come where Keith goes, Oh, I saw this game. And I'm like, I've never heard of that. And then it turns out to be really good. <laughs> games come, every games come without fail. <laughs> you'll see a trailer that I haven't seen and you'll be like, This looks cool. And then I'll play it. I'll be like, That was really good. It's on my game of the year list. Like the sexy brutality. 
and the sojourn which you mentioned to me like is being looking really cool and now i'm like i'm actually quite looking forward to playing it but uh yeah algorithms suck they're not the way forward please for the love of god stop using them <laughs> as your primary driver of traffic to other people's yeah. pages keith there's a lot of games out this week there is and there's also something which is not quite a game. There's a couple of so things on there that aren't a game. <laughs> how about I take you through some of them? So to begin with, on September the 17th, we have Groundhog Day, like Father Like Son, come to PS, VR, Rift, and Vive. Kind of wondering that is actually basically just Groundhog Day, but... Uh, um, then we have the Sega Mega Drive Genesis Mini Console launch. In North America, it comes out on September the 19th. In the EU, it comes out on October the 4th. On September the 19th, we also get the games Crying Sun on PC. Mutazone. Mutazone? On PC, I PS4. Don't know. Mutazone? Yeah. Me? Me? Train Simulator 2020 on PC. Grid Autosport on Switch. Apple Arcade Service Launch also on September the 19th. Overland on PC, PS4, Xbox One and Switch. And then on September the 20th, we have The Legend of Zelda, Link's Awakening on Switch. Untitled Goose Game, PC and Switch. Great name for a game. Reign of Reflections, Chapter 1. Reign of Reflections also is a really great name. (laughs) Um, Nintendo Switch Lite console launch on September the 20th. Uh, The Souljourn, the Souljourn, PC, PS4 and Xbox One, which we've just mentioned. And then Niflheim on (laughs) PS, Xbox One and Switch. On title Goose Game, man. Honk. <laughs> Have you seen anything about it? <laughs> you just play a goose who's a bit of a dick. And I love the fact that they stuck with the name Untitled Goose Game. You know, I felt like saying on all gooses a bit of a dick, but yeah. I mean, probably, but <laughs> it just makes the game accurate, right? It's going to be the number one driving force behind Switch Lite sales. Not this Legend of Zelda game. <laughs> Goose game. Ah, uh, the Sojourn. I'm actually genuinely looking forward to. Thank you for pointing it out to me. It's yeah. one, one game every year that Keith points out. Yeah, me. there, there always appears to be one game every year that you appear to, at least that you appear to miss from a uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's weird, isn't it? It's just like the there was the year before. Like there was like, the year before you you pointed something out to me as well. I can't remember what it was. Was in your E3 awards, and you were like, "This game looks really cool," and I was like, "I've never heard of it." <laughs> and the year before that, you did one, and the year before that was the sexy brutality. And it's like every year you just go, "This game," and I've just somehow wandered through like two hundred game trailers and just not <laughs> seen this one. I think, you get, I think these are from the oversaturation. It's possible the amount of games on this list that I know, like what they are is is quite is quite insane <laughs> like yeah. for one person to like try and hold in their brain all mm-hmm. at once like the only game i don't know is the one that we can't pronounce yeah yeah it's and i mean some of them are consoles so <laughs> that is gonna do it for episode 175 i think yeah of the words about games cast thanks for joining me I'm going to have the proper tape on my screw on this arm because it's a microphone arm. I'm back mm-hmm. using a microphone arm. Um, so I won't be like terrified of this giant microphone right in front of my face. I mean, I probably still will be because, you know, I'll probably still get in trouble <laughs> for saying something <laughs> controversial. Keith, give me a closing thought. What have you learned today? What do you do? What, what do you want to leave people with as they exit this podcast? Never eat yellow snow. Never eat yellow snow. Say bye, Keith. Bye bye.